What's okay, up, y'all? Let me hear you. <laughs> who, who we got here? That I can't see the. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> All right, well, for y'all that don't know me, I'm Amanda. I'm the founder of Fiveable, and I was an AP World teacher, and I'm gonna show you guys what happened on the SAQs that you guys wrote uh, this week. It was like 95 uh, students submitted practice SAQs, which was awesome. So I'm super proud of y'all for doing that. Um, Caroline, you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Caroline Custianos, and um, after Amanda's done kind of talking about our practice SAQ, then we'll all continue on and we will do some more practice and kind of look at how we can make our answers better. Woohoo! And then also we're gonna do this again, um, probably next week, some version of this, whether with the SAQ or with the LEQ, so that you guys can submit practice essays to us and we'll grade them and send them, send you guys feedback, which is good. Cause I think the, the good thing from doing this was that even though there weren't a lot of like perfect answers, it's only October. So we have plenty of time to fix it. Cool. Let's jump in. Okay. Uh, <laughs> really, I'm live. <laughs> okay. So I'm still going through the slides, right? Yeah. So you're on the slides. Okay. All right, sorry guys, this is my first stream with another person. Uh, but real quick, um, tonight, if you're still awake, we've got Traveler's Tales with Melissa. So Traveler's Tales on our Silk Road and Indian Ocean Road. And so that's 11 p.m. Eastern or 7 p.m. Pacific, if I did the math right on that. 8 p.m. So, 8 p.m. Eastern. So, no worries. Yeah, math, you, this is why I'm not streaming for calculus. Um, <laughs> Sunday, um, we've got our live student study group with Shruti and Varun, and this is the dream team. You guys need to study with these two. They're a lot of fun and they definitely know their content. And then, um, again, if you're awake later that night, um, networks of exchange with Jamal. Okay. And in the stream, we're going to hear from Amanda first, and then we'll do some SAQ strategies and then work through some more practice SAQs. Perfect. Cool. So Caroline wrote this prompt uh, from Sunday's stream, which was about diasporas. Do you want to give a quick recap too, just about what is a diaspora? Yeah, so a diaspora is a spreading out of people. So um, people have, have moved away for one reason or another. And sometimes it's a nice move like, um, we talked a lot about the merchant community, so Muslim merchants or Chinese merchants or Hindu or whatever merchants moved out to port cities or trade cities for business. So a lot of times it's for opportunity. Sometimes it's forced, like there's a large slave diaspora, um, you know, from Africa uh, once the African slave trade gets really going, or I, I guess it has been going for a long time. And so we talked about other diaspora, like there's a big Syrian one today um, mm -hmm. and just, just any, you know, people moving. And some of the ideas are that they kind of have a sense of home and they might want to return home. Um, but yeah, just a spreading out of people. And then when people go somewhere new, they bring their culture with them. And so there's a lot of good effects from people spreading out. Totally. So in this prompt, A and B were all about continuity. So you had to stay in the time period 1200 to 1450, but you had to identify and explain two continuities, one in part A, one in part B. Um, some of the examples that we came up with of like correct answers that you could have talked about are basically like the causes of diasporas in that time period um, were always about trade. Um, that was always one of the causes, not that every diaspora was because of that, but because the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean trade were like in full swing, you have merchants that are always on the move, for example. Um, what was another one that we had? Uh, the, they always yeah, spread but, religions throughout the time frame. Right. So the the communities themselves were always spreading religions such as, you know, Buddhism, Islam. Judaism, um, because they're taking their cultures with them. 
The thing that is really important to note though is that you had to really relate what you were actually arguing back to diaspora. So you couldn't just talk about, this is just a continuity of this time period. You had to be really specific about what was, how was that a continuity related to the communities themselves? And then in part C, you had to think about a change, um, but you also had to think about it after 1450. So I'm um, curious for you guys, if you're in the chat, what is the like current thing that you're studying right now, like this week, just out of curiosity for us. One of the things we were talking about is that C was probably hard because you're not necessarily beyond 1450 yet, um, but you could, you could still think about like some of the things you might know of even today that may make it different. All right, let's jump into some of the big trends. So all in all, out of three points, uh, let's go to the next slide, yeah. So yeah, so out of three, no worries. So out of three points, the average was a 0.36, which was not super great, but it's not all that different than sometimes what happens on the May exam. Uh, actually go back a couple of slides to the trends. All right, cool. So this is like basically as I was grading them, this is these are the things that I, I saw the most that people did wrong. And so the when they would lose points in parts A and B, these this is what was happening. It was almost the same thing that I was writing every time. So for example, sometimes the student would identify, like just say like the Silk Roads continued or trade continued, but they weren't actually relating that to diasporas. And so in that sense, you're not really answering the question. You're just you're just identifying a continuity in the time period. And so my suggestion with that is just relate it. Think about if I know that trade is a continuity, think about how trade could have been a cause or an effect of diasporas and relate that in your answer. Um, some other pieces were just being super vague. Like we say this a lot, but like we really mean it. You gotta be specific in what you're answering because the reader, even though there's a lot of times as a reader that you, you read something and you know this kid knows the right answer, but they are not saying it. And so that's the biggest, it's, it like breaks our hearts as readers when we see it because it's like, just say it, just say the words. Just, you know, last, like you were talking about on Sunday, you talked about ACE. And in that first part of ACE, it's answer the question. And so you got to make sure to be really specific in that. So just saying that like Jewish people stayed Jewish would not be, would not work because one, you're not relating it to diasporas and two, you're being really vague too. Um, other pieces were just using uh, examples that were outside of the time period. So like Muhammad's death as a catalyst for diasporas was, n that's not in this time period. And I saw a lot too that like, uh, Slavery continued, it's like the same thing. It's like, yes, it continued, but like be specific, tie it to diaspora. So these are like, these are the big things that I saw in parts A and B. So why people missed the continuity point. A lot of y'all got real close, but just like, just didn't say enough detail. All right, then let's talk about part C really quick and then I'll show you some examples. Oh, no worries. I don't see part C. Is it there? I don't think so. It's right after A and B. Where am I next? Well, basically the issue in in part C before example one. Hmm, I don't know. Anyways, the, the issue with the change was essentially that um, people were writing about pre-1450 and so you're misreading the question. So that's gonna happen. Like short answer questions are built this way. It's, you know, meant to be a, a variation of the time periods. And so you've got to make sure you read really closely. So if part A and B are saying for, uh, 1200 to 1450, but part C is saying after 1450, just make sure that you're answering it in the proper time period. Um, the other big thing was just, again, not being clear. And then also just, um, skipping part C, a lot of people just didn't do part C and I could tell that some people were running out of time. So just making sure that you are pacing yourself so that you get to answer everything. Uh, I don't want you to have to leave anything blank. 
So this was an example of one that got a three out of three. I do want to like um, mention that this was sort of like a barely got a three out of three. It's a subjective process. So, you know, the reader is going to have to make a choice. Does this, is this good enough to get the point? Especially with short answer questions. It's not a rubric. It's you get it or you don't. And so they're going to have to make a decision. And so in this one, this was the only one that got a three out of three and I barely made the decision. So my biggest suggestion for y'all is like be super specific so that the reader sees what you wrote and is like, I don't have to think twice about this. I know for sure this is going to get the point. Like they get so like giddy when they get it. Uh, so just to like quickly show you what this looks like when it's done correctly. So for example, one continuity in diasporas in this time period was Judaism. The thing that got this person the point though is the end of part A. The fact that they're actually talking about that the faith had spread across the Mediterranean due to slave trade, thus a new diaspora of Judaism cropped up in Europe. So it's not just Judaism was a continuity, they are actually taking us, making that connection for us. Um, I think it could have been more clear and that could have been easier to get that point, but it does do it. Yeah, and um, I don't think the Jews were enslaved in Europe at this time, but you can have minor mistakes like that as long as it doesn't detract from, you know, you didn't counter, you know, counteract the idea of dis diaspora. So, so that little mistake was fine. Well, yeah, that's a good catch. I didn't even see that the first time I went through it. And then, <laughs> um, yeah. Can you see Allie's comment? Yeah. So, Allie, the everyone that submitted SAQs, the grade and the feedback was posted on Schoology. So we're just we're gonna keep using Schoology for now until we're able to sort of build that into Fiveable. Um, but if you log in, you, you can see your score. And if you don't know how to get there, just let me know and I'll show you. Okay, um, in, yeah, I'm super stoked about that. In B, so this one, same thing. So they, they just kind of picked a different religion. So Buddhism also had a continuity, but its spread was intentional through trade on the Silk Road. Buddhist monks would set up missionaries in different areas on the Silk Road. So that works for that point. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree. Um, ways to make it better would just say this happened throughout the time period, you know, yeah. over, over, but, but it's, it's there, it's there. So. It's like same thing, right? I read it and I was like, Ooh, like it's close enough. It yeah. you'll see from the other ones too. It's definitely like, it's doing a good job. And then in C, after 1450, diaspora became more common because of the age of exploration. And so here they're specifically talking about a Christian diaspora when I guess that's not really like force. I don't know if that would totally count, but they're yeah. specifically talking about the new world. And so the fact that they like have this connection to a post 1450 example of diasporas becoming more common, especially in going to the Americas, like that's a massive change after 1450. I thought I thought y'all would like pick up on that one because even though if, even if you haven't studied past fourteen fifty, you know about that. Yeah, I figured everyone would put like there's a new African diaspora in the Americas, or you know the African diaspora used to just be in Afro Eurasia, and now it's in the Americas with the slave trade. But yeah, but now y'all know. <laughs> cool. All right, so this is an example of one that got all the points, but like I said, it's not like a perfect, perfect example. This could be better, but if we show you really quick the ones that did not get the points, you'll see what, I'm, what I mean here. So in A and B, they are not really talking about diaspora. It's like they never really, they mention it in that like they're repeating the question, but they never actually like relate what they said back to diasporas. Um, and so, you know, in A, they're talking about Confucianism, but they're never going back to a movement of people. In B, they're talking about the Mongols and conquering lands, which was not a continuity because it started and ended in the time period. But it, no matter what, in this answer, like the way that it's written, it just doesn't, it doesn't actually like say the, it doesn't relate to the, the question. Yeah, I'm not sure if the student completely understood what a diaspora was. And I know we had way more students write than that watch the stream. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, and this is where SAQs are brutal. If you don't know the answer, 
you're going to write something, of course, but it, it doesn't help you. <laughs> For sure. Like that, I mean, ultimately the biggest issue is just like not knowing what the word diaspora was. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Luckily you can check out that re that replay. And so there's a good replay for that. Another, this is the same thing, right? So you can see in A and B, you know, Indian Ocean trade is a continuity, Silk Road is a continuity, but again, they're not relating that to diasporas. They don't even really say it beyond repeating the way that it is in the question. And so, you know, if they could have, um, they could have been, they're close, but they don't really know what diasporas are. So if they had mentioned merchants, that would have been a game changer. Yeah, these are all true statements, but not for this question. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you guys definitely know a lot about trade. So that's awesome. And so if the question were just, what was a continuity in 1200 to 1450, then this would be great. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then the last one, same thing. It just is not, it's just not really connected. So those are my two cents on what happened. Um, I think, I mean, first of all, the fact that like a hundred students submitted practice responses, like super shout out to all of you because I mean, unless your teacher like really actually gave you a grade for it, like you're just, you're just trying to practice. You're trying to get better. And so, you know, it's mid October you're taking the time to do this and to review it, you're going to be fine when it comes time to, you know, when we get to the spring. And I think the few, like the few twists and turns that I would take are really just about, you know, making sure you read the question and answer what's there. You know, like, even if you don't, if you don't know what the word is, you got to try to do your best to kind of guess on it. I get, you know, like there's not much I can say for that. Knowing the word would be helpful, but let's say you do know what the word means, then, you definitely just need to make sure that you are doing everything you can to be very explicit in answering the question. And you don't, it does, it's not about length. Like there were some that, that were answered in like whole paragraphs for each one, but they just sort of wrote a lot of details that didn't actually talk about diasporas. So don't feel like you have to stuff everything you know about this time period in those three sentences. You just need to actually answer exactly what it's asked of you. Any last like pieces of feedback from this question? Um, no. Cool. Any well, questions? if anyone that's if or anyone that's here wants to try it out again and answer the prompt, the prompt is still posted in Schoology. Um, I'll I'll reopen it up for the night, and so if you wanted to give it another shot, I'll I'll grade them again, just as a I don't know a second shot for fun. <laughs> yeah, sounds good, right? And the, the biggest thing you can do is rewrite your SAQs and your essays until they're, you know, the top score. Um, but if you never kind of go back and correct it, you usually mm -hmm. never, you know, if you get a score of a three on a DBQ and you don't go back and correct it, you never really get above that, that three, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. That's and such so, a good point. Yeah. yeah. And so, and and if any of you too like want help and it's just like a second pair of eyes looking at an essay, like if you get one back and you want to rewrite it, but you need someone to look at it, you can hit us up for that too. And we'll put up a, a more clear way for you to submit them, but we're here for you. Yeah. Cool. Um, if a response was not submitted the first time, can it be done again when you open? Yeah, I'll open it right now. Um, I'll let Caroline take it away. She has like a whole bunch of more tips and tricks for how to get these short answer points. So I'll reopen it up. My suggestion is hang out for the next 40 minutes, learn everything you can about SAQs and then knock it out of the park when you practice it. And it's gonna be awesome when you like get the three out of three so you know what it feels like and what it looks like to write a perfect response. And just like she said, then the next time you do it in class, you're gonna kill it. Sound good? Sounds good. All right, I will see you guys soon. And I'm out. Okay. I'll Thank I'll you let so you handle the questions since you're going to keep going or I'll answer them in the chat so you can just keep going into okay. the stream. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So I can't believe we, we had the queen of fiveable helping us out tonight and she did teach AP world history. So, um, that was kind of her, her passion in creating fiveable was like, how can we make more resources for students and teachers? 
Um, and so here we are. All right. So um, just a couple little kind of tricks before we get into some more um, practice questions. Um, so you're going to have three sets of these questions. So we know it's in A, B, and C, and you can you can answer them in like two to three sentences. Um, it's got to be complete sentences. So no bullet points, AP Human Geo, I believe you could do bullet points. So, you know, this is, we're, we're graduating up <laughs> and um, you've got to include an example and an explanation. So, you know, the question was, what's a continuity in diaspora communities? You can't just say, well, the Jews are a continuity. That's not enough. You've got to explain it, right? And you don't need a thesis or a conclusion. And so if you're new to SAQs, just looking at the examples Amanda showed us, you can see how it's just short sentences. All right, so we're going to have three sets of SAQs and you have 40 minutes to answer three sets. So that's about 13 and a half minutes per question. And so um, Amanda set the timer in Schoology to I think 13 and a half minutes. So it's really quick. So you've, um, but with my students, like I give them more time at the beginning of the year, but by the end of the year, it's 13 and a half minutes. And so just work up on your, on your, um, how fast you are. Okay. So one set will have a reading passage. So we're going to look at one tonight with a reading passage. And then one will have a visual. So some kind of illustration map or political cartoon. And then the last set won't have the stimulus at all. So it'll just be three questions like we gave you with the diaspora one. Um, sometimes I find that one's easier unless, you know, you don't know the answer. But um, OK, so here's my strategy that I do with my students. So I do um, I really like ACE and let me get my pointer here. All right. So ACE. Uh, so answer the question, cite evidence or examples. Um, now, it's not cite like English where you're quoting or citing a source. It's uh, So some teachers actually like to do ape and put provide evidence or examples. So just make sure it's not, you know, you're just giving some examples, right? And then explain. So explain basically how this answers the question. And on those last couple samples, um, basically they needed to explain how that answers the question, right? Like, um, God, I can't even remember. But so, yeah, you've got these group of people that move, moved out, right? They're, they're moving out or you're talking about merchants, but you've got to say, oh, well, they moved out, right? that's why they're a diaspora right and this and why is it a continuity because they did this throughout the time period okay um some teachers do uh, sir claim evidence reasoning it's the same thing right it's answering the question um providing evidence and then your your reasoning or analysis okay so um so i'm going to show you that with my examples all right um so if you're Example did not score well. Don't feel bad. I have some real student examples here that also may not have scored well. So this is um, an example from a passage. And so this one I created, and um, this is kind of one that I do early in the school year. Um, and it's to kind of help walk my students through the process. Now, with the reading passage, the passage often does not all the answers aren't in the passage, like maybe the first one, part A is in the passage and then B and C, you've got to make some connections. Um, this one, all the answers are in the passage. So this is kind of my like starter SAQ. I'm sure if we had given this one, the scores would have been too high. OK, so the first thing I like to do on the passage is um, read the question, right? So before we go look at the passage, so the questions are identify and explain one environmental cause, right? So I, I make sure my students highlight this. So one environmental cause of the spread of the Black Plague, and then identify and explain one economic cause of the Black Plague. And then, come on. Identify and explain one economic 
or political effect of the Black Plague. So this way we know when we read the passage, because we have to read it quickly, right? If we only have 13 and a half minutes to read this and then also write three answers, um, we can't spend, you know, 10 minutes trying to interpret the passage. Okay, so we're good, right? We're looking for an environmental cause, an economic cause, and then we've got to look for effects, an economic or political effect. So uh, bear with me. So if we read this one out loud, how did the Black Death spread so far? One explanation may lie in climatic changes. A drawing up of the Central Asian steppe borderlands where bubonic plague had existed for centuries may have forced rodents out of their usual dwelling places and pressed pastoral peoples who carried the strains to move closer to settled agricultural communities. Hmm. Have we seen a cause, an environmental cause yet? If you want to answer in the chat, do you know what the environmental cause is? Yes. Okay. Yes, he knows. All right. Okay. So climate change, a drying up. What do we call a drying up? We have a technical term for that. We're technically having one of these in my part of Texas, while the other half of Texas is flooding. Okay, a drought. Good. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we've got the first answer. Okay, let's see if we can find the second one. But what spread the germs across Afro-Eurasia was the Mongols trading network. All right. Have we picked up on our economic cause yet? The main avenue of transmission, okay, trade itself. Yes, very good. Okay, the main avenue of transmission was across Central Asia to the Crimea and the Black Sea, and from there by ship to the Mediterranean Sea and the Italian city-states. Secondary routes were by sea, one from China to the Red Sea, and another across the Indian Ocean through the Persian Gulf and into the Fertile Crescent in Iraq. Okay, uh, that's going on and on. Okay, so trade, right? When another... When farmers were afflicted, food production collapsed. Famine then followed and killed off the weak survivors. The shortage of food and other necessities led to rapidly rising prices, work stoppages, and unrest. Political leaders added to their unpopularity by repressing the unrest. Okay, so have we found our effects? So um, I highlighted them there. But so as you read through, you know, annotate, highlight, right, kind of look for those answers. Um, all right. So our economic effect would be rapidly rising prices. Right. So as um, those farmers die and not enough people are growing the food. Right. So food's in short supply. So the price goes up. Uh, work stoppages are kind of like strikes. Right. So the peasants were like, yeah, well. I'm not going to farm your land for free. How about you pay me? Um, and unrest is just general, like the peasants are upset. Um, we have a lot of peasant revolts at this time where they're like, hey, I'm alive. I'm ready to farm, but you're going to have to pay me and give me a raise, right? I'm no longer doing this stuff for free. And then a political effect would be that, you know, the leaders kind of, they suppress the unrest. They basically attack the farmers, right? Um, they put them in jail. They sent, you know, the, the military after them to, you know, force them back to work. And so that will make them very unpopular. Okay. Are we ready to look at an example? Okay. So try this one. Um, I'll go ahead. I'll try to stop talking <laughs> for a couple minutes and y'all read this one. And then in the chat, go ahead and put what score you would um, score this one. So zero, one, two, or three. Okay, Mauricio is ahead of the game. Okay, I feel, okay, yes, he's also got the two. I don't know, are you sure it's a two? Okay, two or three. I always find students grade harder than the teachers do. Okay, 
Okay. Well, we're about 30 minutes in, so let's go ahead and look at these answers so we can get to some more examples. Okay. Uh, has a lot of good examples and answers. Questions pretty well. Yeah. So this is not, it's not like an amazing answer, but I did give it three points. And so I highlighted in pink the answer to the question, the evidence in green, and then, then the explanation in that blue. So I hope these colors don't give you a headache. So one environment cause, okay, and typos are okay. Cause of the spread of the Black Plague was climate change. Okay, so she knows she's got that right. And then the drying up of Central Asia caused the rats to move out there and move into areas where contact with people is uh, unavoidable. Um, to make this better, if she had put something, um, you know, so therefore, you know, the drought was an environmental cause that, you know, kind of accidentally caused the spread of the Black Plague, it would make it a little bit better. But this, this is actually okay. Okay, let's look at part B. One economic cause of the spread of the Black Plague was the Mongols trade network. Since people traveled across Central Asia to the Crimea, Black Sea, and then across. So she's kind of just paraphrasing, like you never want to quote ever in history. We want to know what you, the student, thinks. Um, but we can forgive that because the rest is kind of okay. The disease also went with the people. Since it traveled with people, it caused it to spread a lot. Again, not a perfect answer, not the best kind of grammar, but they are getting the gist of it. Okay, part C, one economic effect of the Black Plague was a shortage of food along with rising prices. Since a lot of people died, there wasn't anyone to produce food. Since people obviously needed food, the prices went up due to supply and demand. Okay, those who gave it a two, which one did you think should not have received a point? I'm curious, and these are subjective, right? Um, so Mauricio and Yessi, which one do you think should not have received the point? I'm just kind of curious. B. Okay, it wasn't uh, saying it wasn't quite enough. It was the Mongols trade network? Um, yeah, I would have exact. Okay, I would have liked um, them to say something like, "Well, the rats." you know, things that they traded on the network, the rats got into them, or the fleas were in the silk or the carpets. Um, that would have made this better. Now, the other thing is, it is subjective. And if as a whole, during the reading at the end of the year, if the responses are bad, you know, they've got to scale it. We can't have everybody fail the test. So some kind of questionable answers like this will get threes, right? Um, so, so yeah. Okay, let's look at this one. Okay, how would you score this one? Okay, I'm not actually going to have y'all score it. Let's look at this. Okay, this one, um, a lot of people died from the Black Plague. A climatic change helped it spread and death rates rise from 25 to 30%. It also made people and caused animals move to closer agricultural communities. Um, I know y'all were going to give these, this one all zeros. Um, so yeah, it's not really answering. They got the climatic change, but their explanation really didn't answer how the what the climatic change was, that it was a drought and how it made the animals move towards the people, right? They're kind of pulling phrases from the the passage but i'm not sure they understand it okay b they rose food prices really high due to that's not even a word um so this is a bad example and then is that a cause that's actually an effect and b they're given an effect instead of a cause and then work stoppages people demanded more pay again you've got you've got to explain this one okay this one oh Let's go through this one together. Okay, um, so <laughs> the Black Death is one disease spread by the rodents or the flea on them. There were many bad things that happened because of the Black Death. I think this is supposed to be an intro or a thesis. Don't do this. I don't know how many times I told the student, don't do this, and you know, it still happened. Um, you're wasting time. 
Okay, let's see if she got anything in here. One environment cause of the Black Plague is climatic changes like drying up Central Asian drought, which force rodents out of their usual dwelling place and the rodents move closer to settled agricultural communities. Um, I think I gave, I gave this a point because they basically got it, but it wasn't explained really well. Um, and here I put that how, add how the rats brought the disease with them. Um, part B, an economic effect, what's well, supposed to be a cause. So an economic effect is that if farmers were afflicted, there would be less food, which would lead to rapidly rising food prices. Um, so it needed, um, so it's okay. So if you don't label them A, B, and C, and if in B you're really answering C, that's okay. And I want to say at the last read, even if you labeled them A, B, and C, but you really answered C and B, you still got, you still got the point. Um, Cause we're looking for right answers. We're not, if you have a right answer, college board does want to give it to you. Um, but yeah, this was, this is one where I'm like, I don't know. It's basically there. Should I give it to them or not? And the point of this is, the more I have to think, should I give it to you? Should I not give it to you? Is it really there? The more you're probably going to lose that point. So that's why we want, you know, good, clear answers. Okay. Another economic effect is that the Chinese population went from 120 million to 80 million over a century. Europe's numbers shrunk by one third. So many populations went down. Okay. Um, Population and demographics actually goes in the environmental category, not economic. And so they didn't pick up on the work or the food shortages. Um, so that doesn't get a point. And then you can see this student also gave kind of this closing. The plague had many causes. Just You don't do that. Okay, let's go to, uh, sorry that my responses are all kind of about the Black Plague um, or kind of Middle Ages. Um, or I'm just trying to pick ones that aren't, you know, copyrighted by someone else. So this is what we ended up with. Okay, so let's see if we can look at this visual. Everyone's still with me? Okay, um, and I had to recreate this so it doesn't look so great. So we've got percentage of major cities by region. So 1100 CE, so a little bit before our time frame, but we'll just say 1200. And so it's percentage of major cities, right? So who has big cities? The visual question, I actually, this one I don't think is hard, but sometimes it's really hard on the AP test. Um, okay, so we've got America's at 3%. So they have 3% of the biggest cities. Uh, Europe, I think is the gray with 11%. East and Southeast Asia is the big one, right? So China's in there. Middle East and North Africa is the second largest. Did we get them all? Okay, so that's your who has the biggest cities in 11, 1200. And then by 1450, what are kind of the changes here? So the Americas now has 4%. So it's, it's you know, and then um, Europe has 23 three east and southeast asia is at 35 middle east and north africa at 23 oh and we have a new player we have sub-saharan africa at three percent okay is everyone pretty good with the charts we kind of understand what's happening okay good yeah it's a little easier if you had them on paper okay so I've got that. I think I understand it. So let's read our questions. Identify and explain one pattern of continuity. All right, so back to our continuities. In the distribution of the world's largest cities between 1100 and 1450. So they're asking for what stays the same or relatively the same from here to here. B, identify and explain one pattern of change in the distribution of the world's largest cities. Okay, so um, I think I might have accidentally given it away, but there's something different, right? There's something different in this one. That's what they're asking for. And then identify and explain one factor that led to urban decline, all right? So kind of decrease in cities, renewal of cities, or expansion of cities. Okay, 
So what do I have here? All right, so what continuities do you see? So if we're thinking about part A, what are some things that stay the same from our 1100 to our 1450? Anyone wanna put anything in the chat? Or should I just point them out? I know I can talk faster than you. Okay, East Asia stays the same. All right, good. Okay, so we'll just go here. Um, okay. Um, all right. So the continuities, okay, when I move my pointer, it doesn't work. Um, so I'm pretty sure y'all are going to come up with the same ones as me. So America's remains a small percentage, right? East and Southeast Asia is still the largest percentage. So we've got to do a kind of math in here. Um, South Asia and Middle East remain about the same, right? So the big thing is like one stays really small, one stays really big. Okay, so that should be, you know, we should be able to get that. And what about the changes? Um, Europe increases, right? Europe goes from 11% to 23%, right? It doubles. So that's big. And then Sub-Saharan Africa is now on the graph. Okay. Uh, an entirely new category. Yeah. So um, gosh, some of my students really struggled with this and I was like, are you not looking at the graph? But, um, you know, there, uh, yeah, there's a whole new category, right? So that's obviously something new. Okay. All right. So what about, so why do cities decline, renew, or expand? And so any idea like some big event that maybe killed cities and then black plague very good okay um all right so here i've got um so this is kind of our rubric of answers so europe cities declined during the middle ages which would fit in this time frame um oh either due to political fragmentation right y'all remember fall of rome that kind of falls apart. People retreat into the countrysides and into these tiny kingdoms. Um, the barbarian invasions, right? That's gonna, people again, retreat into the countryside. They think they're safer from invasions. Um, and the Black Plague, of course, right? When a lot of people die, cities, of course, are gonna fall apart. Okay, so then renewal, um, well, when the plague is gonna end in this time frame. And you don't have to remember, memorize the exact dates of the plague. Um, as long as you know, you know, it, it's happening during our first time period and it's also going to end in that time period. Um, so, yeah, after the plague ends, then we get our renaissance, which we probably don't talk about too much in world history. But, you know, they're going to regrow the cities. Right. Um, they start to get you know, trade and the education back and the technology. So cities are going to expand. And then as, you know, people are living, right, they're not dying, those cities will grow. And then even the Crusades, right? Remember, those are during this time frame as your knights go across to the Middle East and they see all the technology and medicine and all these, you know, spices and everything, they bring them back and they want to trade. They don't want to give up cinnamon and pepper and all these really good things. And so the cities are going to grow to trade. And then expansion. Um, so cities grow larger in sub-Saharan Africa due to the growth of port cities, right? So they're, uh, um, you know, now in the game for the Indian Ocean trade. Um, so things like that. Um, the Americas and Incas, um, so there's still a small, small percentage, but the Aztecs and Incans are at their heyday, right? This is right before the Spanish are going to explore and basically wipe them out. And so they're, they have a few really big cities, but they aren't growing enormously because uh, like in the Americas, most besides your Aztec, Incas, Mayas, which are already gone, most of your Native American societies are, are very small. Um, any other answers we could add in there? Okay. All right. Let's see if we should score some. Okay. Um, see what you would give this one. I'm going to read it with y'all.
Okay. A two, a one, two. Okay. So we got, all right, you guys are spot on. Okay. Uh, so one pattern of continuity is that of East and Southeast Asia remaining the two regions that have the largest percentage of the biggest cities in the world. Now, if the question just says identify a continuity, this is fine. If it says identify and explain, they should probably have a little bit more like kind of the how does this answer the question part? They haven't really explained, but this is okay. I've graded SAQs like three or four years in a row and it's not the longest answer, but they got it right, right? I mean, that's right, it's fine. Same with number two, one pattern of change is that Europe doubled in percentage of largest cities and that Sub-Saharan Africa is now a contender and containing some of the largest cities. So they pointed out both of them, okay. Um, so this would most likely get a one, it's fine. Uh, one factor that led to urban expansion was the event and the need. Okay, well, how does that make cities grow? You know, they might have had a really good explanation of how that makes cities grow. Um, I don't really know what that would be, <laughs> okay. Um, let's look at this one. Let's do this one together for time's sake. Uh, the America's percentage of major cities, oh, did I just skip that one? Stayed relatively the same. Oh, those are two different. Okay, sorry. I think I messed up my slides. The America's percentage of major, major cities by region stays relatively the same, only going up 1%. Um, I guess. This isn't great but they've got the idea and again you know don't make me have to wonder if i should give you the point or not the percentage of major major cities by region in europe doubles from 11 to 23 percent i would really like a reason why right um oh because they came out of the black plague that would make this better and then with the improvement in the big cities and the technology it led to a major increase okay that's no Okay, let's try this one. Um, oh, I did answer it here. Okay, um, probably a one, but I gave a suggestion for the what they what kind of explanation they could add in. The Incas and Aztecs had some large cities, but they did not have a population boom or immigration to trigger major city growth. So they stayed about the same. So. If you're gonna put in an explanation, it's kind of why does the America stay at that lower percentage, right? Um, what would make part B better? Oh yeah. So these can be a little bit shorter, right? Uh, and part C is really asking, is really more of the kind of why are there changes? Um, but the student didn't really pick up on that one. Okay, let's look at this last one together. Okay. Ah, here's our good example. Uh, one pattern of continuity in the world's largest cities between 1100 are East, Southeast Asia, and Middle East, Africa still have the most percentages. Okay, and then I couldn't read some word. All right, so they have the largest, so that's correct. Let's look at their explanation. For example, before they owned 40 and 30%, but now they have 35 and 23, which is still the largest out of them all. So that's good. And I really like this, which is still the largest out of them all. So that that we're going to count that as explanation. Okay, part B, one pattern of change in the world's largest cities between 1100 and 1400 is that a new major city was formed and that city is the sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, it should be region. We'll cut them a break on that. You know, we know what they mean. For example, before it was just five regions and now it's six with a sub-Saharan Africa started to trade a lot and became very wealthy. Ah, so they've got a little explanation in there. I would like them to say, and so the cities grew because of this trade. That would make it where I'm not even questioning this answer. Okay. One factor that led to an urban decline was disease. In Europe, the Black Plague was happening around this time and it killed a third of the population. Therefore, cities decreased as people died off. Okay. So I think I like part C. 
Um, so again, these are trickier ones because they're real student examples. If you did tune in to the diaspora stream, I typed the examples myself. And so those were really good at doing the ACE, the answer the question, explanation or evidence, and then explanation because I typed those. So if you want to see like really good answers, go there. Okay, let's keep going. We've got 10 minutes. Okay, so Amanda already went through this one. Okay, <laughs> this question. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you something a little bit different here. And these were written by our lead teacher, Eric Beckman. And he's got these hard questions. Um, okay, so this one, it's uh, I was trying to fit it on the slide. And I know if you're on your phone, it's hard to see. So it's all kind of shoved in the slide. But um, this is the source, so we're gonna read the source first. It's from Rashid al-Din, a Persian convert from Judaism to Islam, served the Il Khanate, and it's the Compendium of Chronicle, or Compendium of Chronicles was a history of Eurasia. Okay, so it's written by this guy. Do we know what the Il Khanate is? Have y'all covered the Mongols? Yes. Okay. Um, so to make sure we know, so the ill, con so the Mongol Empire was divided into four khanates, right, or four regions, and they each had their own, I guess, governor. And so the ill khanate is like the Persian one, right? So the the kind of uh, Middle East one. And so most people there were Muslims. All right. So we've got our source, and then we've got a passage, and then of course the picture. So let's read the passage. Between the countries of Katai and Central Asia and Karakoram, new post stations were established in addition to the existing stations. All right, so these are like postal stations, right? And they kind of have this Pony Express to go uh, from station to station. At every stage, a Timon, which is an army division, sometimes of 10,000 men, was posted for the protection of the post stations. And Ogodai had issued a law to the effect that every day 500 wagons fully loaded with food and drink should arrive there from the provinces to be placed in stores and then dispensed from there. For grain and wine, there were provided great wagons drawn by six oxen each. All right. So he's talking about these postal stations, right? These are going to be along the Silk Road or other trade routes. Um, so they carry the mail. They carry communication. Um, they're also along the trade routes and there there's the armies there. Right. And so we know the Mongols protected trade. Right. They said when the Mongols were in charge, no one ever got robbed on the Silk Road. Um, presumably the consequences were way too high. You did not want uh, to be tortured by the Mongols. OK. And then we've got a picture. So it looks like. Horses, right, ready to get on the next leg of their kind of Pony Express, some military, little city. Okay, let's look at our questions. Identify one dimension of context. Okay, let me go to the next slide. So this is where, um, okay, my, my students would have like drowned on these questions because they would not understand the prompt. Okay, so the first first prompt, identify one dimension of context for the events depicted in the compendium of Chronicles. So when I have students deconstruct the prompt, because um, sometimes that's half the battle, you're like, I don't know what it's asking me. Um, just rewrite it in your own words. And so um, I practice this a lot with the essay prompts. So how could we rewrite this prompt in our own words? So one, a dimension is like a factor, a development, um, context. So this is historical context. So this is really what they're asking. What is the historical context? So I would rewrite this as the compendium of Chronicles was written during which historical context or development? So does that make more sense? And so what, okay, don't look at the answer. So what would be like the context? So that's what big process is happening when this was written. 
and so it's really, I mean, we've got the answer here. Sorry. Um, I'm really bad about giving the answers away. Um, yes. Trade along the Silk Road. Yeah. So it's trade along the Silk Road, right? It's also during, you know, the Mongol Khanates, right? Protection of trade. It's, yeah, the bigger process is this Silk Road trade. So they really want, so how would we answer this? So um, I would put... See, I would totally rewrite this. I would not do one dimension of context for the events depicted in the compendium of the cron like that A for answer the question, like that's so long. It's going to take me forever to write that. I would just put the historical context um, during the compendium um, was the development of trade along the Silk Road. And then I would give some kind of explanation. So um, this, and this should maybe have dates, but during the time frame, um, the Mongols took over, um, took control of the Silk Road and they protected it, uh, or they expanded communication with the postal route, or they protected the trade, just giving a little bit more of an example. Okay, let's look at part B. Identify and explain one similarity between the two excerpts from the source. Two excerpts. So um, that was the picture. I don't know. Eric in his hard question. Um, so I think it's some similarities between the the text and then the picture. So this one, I don't think the question was so much the problem. Um, so similarities is is usually you know, we understand what's happening there. So the ones I came up with were the military, right? So both are talking about the military or the passage has military protection. And then in the picture, you've got to kind of make some inferences, but I'm going to say those guys riding the horses are the military, right? So they both show the military and how they protect the postal stops in the trade along the route. Um, they're both talking about like trade in the post. Um, and the pictures, you know, again, you make some inferences, right? It's definitely some kind of trade city. Um, I like the horses, like the horses are just sitting there ready, you know, for the next rider to jump on and take the mail down the road. Um, you know, they're in both the passage and in the, the picture. Um, what else, anything else? I thought, I thought this question was kind of hard. Okay, now this, the last one was hard too. Identify and explain one aspect of the sourcing of this document that influences the content. Okay, so this is another one where my kids would have said this. What does that mean? Okay, so this one we've got to rewrite in our own words again. And so an aspect of the sourcing. So it wants to know about the source. So who wrote this? Um, and how does that influence the content? So if, if we're talking about something influencing the content, then that's POV or point of view. So point of view. So this is where I go back. And so I'm like, okay, so we know Rashid wrote this, Aldin wrote this. Um, so would you say that he's writing favorably about these postal stops or he doesn't like them? Go ahead and answer in the chat. So does he like the postal stops or does he think they're a bad thing? Okay. He does like them. Yes, right? He's not saying anything bad about them, right? Okay, good. So that's the first thing. Like, is it positive about the subject or is it negative? Okay, so then he's really asking, okay, so what about this guy makes him like this stuff. Why is he saying good things about it? Okay, so he's a Persian convert from Judaism to Islam. Okay, so um, that could have some influence. He served the ill Khanate. Okay, so that means he worked for the ill Khanate. So he's a government worker in the Persian part of the Mongol Empire. So if you work for the Mongol Empire, are you going to say bad things about it? You can 
No, right? Didn't they like boil people alive and like bury them upside down with their feet? Yeah, we don't say bad things about the Mongols. Okay, so um, so that's what he's looking for here. Um, okay, let me get the kind of PowerPoint stuff out of the way here. All right, so I have in here is the content positive. If so, why would the author portray the subject in a good light? So Aldin works for the Khanate. He is not going to write something criticizing the government. Of course not. Now, he probably also believes in it too, right? So communication was fast, right? That's good. We get the mail. We know what's happening. Um, so he has a lot of good things to say. Um, one, because he's a government worker, right? Um, I would go with that. Um, now, you could also take it a step further. Maybe that he's Muslim is also influencing what he's saying. I don't think that's the biggest influencer here, but often when they put someone's religion in the source, okay, that's like, if this was a passage on the Crusades, right, then it's coming from a Muslim point of view. And so there, he's definitely gonna, religion would be kind of a big um, point of like bias or his opinion. Um, but you could say something like the Mongols moved artisans. They moved a lot of Muslim artisans throughout the empire. They forcibly moved them into areas that needed their skills. Um, and they did promote Islam. So that could be a factor. But I think the fact that, you know, he works for them is probably going to be the bigger factor. Okay. It's eight o'clock. Do we want to do one more? Let's do one more. Uh, well, actually, so... Um, we can do one more, but are there are there any questions? I kind of feel like my examples were a little bit better on the diaspora one. So um, so I'll work on that on having good examples. Um, so I would basically um, we're gonna keep doing the short answers, right? And then we're gonna um, as long as y'all submit answers, we'll keep grading them. I think it was a lot of, fun to do that right um and so we're going to get better and better and you guys are going to be ready by may okay are these post stations somewhat similar to caravan sarai in africa yes it's the same thing yeah so they're uh well so they have the mongols actual had like like a pony express right they had these stops um for the kind of government mail and the ca caravan sarai were like kind of like makeshift hotels like stops right so you stop and spend the night and so there's shelter and food and probably kind of have a good time with other travelers there so yeah and so these postal stops yeah you've got the guys with their horses ready to kind of keep the mail going but you're gonna have like hotels and food and in the military there and so it's a good stop for um, for also your your travelers and your traders, and it would be a nice safe so safe place to stop. So yeah, it's basically the same thing. Good question. Um, okay, let's do this last one real quick. So this one's kind of similar. This is another one of Eric's. Um, so let's kind of look here. All right. So it's the Catalan Atlas with inscription by Abraham. Uh, my French is bad. Okay. We're going to call him Abraham. Uh, the year is 1375. So the Catalan Atlas is a medieval map from Spain drawn in 1375 by a map maker named Abraham C. Uh, he, he never visited West Africa, but relied on the accounts of travel. So abundant is the gold which is found in his country that he is the richest and most noble king in all the land. Okay, so we know this guy is Mansa Musa, right? You've probably heard of him. So Mansa Musa is seated on a gold throne, wearing a gold crown, holding a gold scepter, and a huge gold coin. The lines are trade routes converging on Mali. Okay, so it's not exactly a traditional map, but we've got the trade routes all coming to Mali, and we've got our rich guy, Mansa Musa. Okay, all right. Okay, so again, this was one where I was kind of like, 
uh, one of the prompts was really hard. Um, identify one difference between the trade and exchange networks of West Africa, so meaning our gold salt roads, and another major Afro-Eurasian network in the period between 1200 to 1500. Okay, so this is a good prompt. It gives you a lot of leeway. You pro um, Looking at your diaspora examples, you guys could answer this one pretty well. Um, why didn't we give you this one? This one would have been better. Okay, um, so what are some of the differences, right? So if we're looking at the gold salt versus the Indian Ocean Road, right? So desert on camels versus, you know, boats on the Indian Ocean. Um, camels, you can travel any time of the year. Um, on the Indian Ocean, what did you need to actually travel? How did you how did you get from China to Africa? Besides the ships, the ships need something to help them get there. Ooh, so going back to your geography, how did the ships? So they you could only travel east six months out of the year. Monsoons. Okay, good. I knew someone would know, right? So you've got to wait for that monsoon period, right? Okay, so those are some pretty good differences. Um, gold salt roads and silk roads carried luxury goods. Um, the Indian Ocean Road carried your more common, cheaper goods. So remember, on a boat, you can you can fit way more goods on a boat. So you could carry um, goods that you can't charge a high price for, right? Like rice, you can only charge so much for rice. So you're not going to carry rice on a camel because you know it's going to cost you more to get it there than what people will pay for it. Um, those were the ones I thought of. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more. Okay, part B, explain one similarity between the trade and exchange networks of West Africa and another major Afro-Eurasian network. Okay, so again, similarities between networks. Um, so anything from Muslim merchants controlled most of the trade on all three networks, right? So Gold Salt, Silk Road, um, Indian Ocean Road, you know, you've got a lot of those Muslim merchants controlling it. Um, or you could do, well, a difference would be like, you know, when Mongols control the Silk Road, they don't control all three, I guess. Where is I going with that? Oh, and then think, you always want to think about what spreads on these trade routes besides trade items, right? So, um, religions, right? So Buddhism is going to spread along the Silk Road. Um, Islam spreads on all of them. Um, what else? I'm sure there's more. Uh, oh, the concept of zero, right? So um, coming from our, you know, Muslim world, right? The math, we can blame them for algebra. Um, oh, the plague, the plague also spreads, right? So good things spread, bad things spread, science and technology. And so, yeah, our Islamic caliphates really spread their kind of golden age of science and literature and all that. And everything spreads on these networks. Okay, good. Okay, the question that I thought was hard was the last one. Okay, this is like the wording. Um, identify one aspect of the sourcing of this document and explain how it influences the document. So this is the same thing. This is that point of view question again. So I would reword this, how does the source influence the document. Okay, um, this, was a, <laughs> this was a good one. I was like, okay, um, I can definitely come up with this one. All right, so Abraham is from Spain. Has he been to Africa? How do you make a map of Africa when you have never been there? And this is more of like a picture. It's not like an accurate map. It's um, but is that going to influence it? The fact that he's never been there and he's relying on travelers accounts. This for sure is going to influence what he says. OK, so when you go on vacation, right? Um, and you don't have a good time, do you tell anyone or do you exaggerate? And you're like, oh, my God, it was so great. And you just don't mention that, you know, you were fighting with your brother for 14 hours, right? Driving, you know, from 
Texas to Minnesota, which just sounds horrible to me. So think about there's probably a lot of exaggeration from travelers' tales, right? Um, but how does it influence the document? Okay, sorry about that. Um, but he's from Spain, right? He's never been there. So how accurate could it be? His map and his depiction could not be completely accurate. He's never been there. It's not firsthand, right? So it's secondhand knowledge. Um, the date, so it's 1375. So this should be the end of the Middle Ages. Um, and so we should be getting into the Renaissance, right? Europe's rebuilding. But if you notice that one description, it said gold like three times. And um, so he's got a gold crown, the gold scepter, like a ball of gold in his hand. And he seems overly impressed by the gold. Um, well, I'm pretty impressed by gold. Oh, he's on a gold throne. And um, so maybe there was some influence like, According to this, it seems like they were just like handing gold out, like bars of gold. They're handing them out on Halloween instead of bars of chocolate. Right. Um, but that wasn't really the case. Right. Yes, there was a lot of gold and salt traded on these roads, but um, a few people were really rich, but not everyone. I don't know. So I think there's a lot there's a lot of um, kind of bias or, you know, just kind of his opinion. Right. How accurate can it be? if you've never been there. And so that's, I think, where I was going with that. Okay, well, it is after 11. I feel like I'm rambling on. Y'all have more homework to do. Um, so so was this helpful? Um, kind of wish I had a little bit better examples, but I like using the student examples. Um, next time, I, I'll probably have ones that kind of show the ace a little bit better. Um, these weren't really great with the explanation part, but we can definitely come up with those. And then as we're doing our streams, we're trying to add in multiple choice or SAQ prompts at the end. So any stream you watch is going to probably help you with, uh, with the skills. Okay. Any questions before we go for the night? I know we're still awake there. Okay, well, that's all I have. Okay, so remember, we've got the link in the chat if you want to rewrite your diaspora um, short answer, or if you want to go see your answer, right, log back in to Schoology, go ahead and rewrite, and we'll regrade, and then we'll probably add those in to another stream, and I'm not sure which one next week, but we are, um, we're going to post another SEQ that we'll grade. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I hope you have a good night. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Okay.